Never Say Never, Finding the Meteor Man song. Don't regret what you've done, regret what you haven't done. Share your interesting stories before you forget them, because if you don't, no one else will remember them either. If the world ended tomorrow and I didn't get to spin this little yarn, I would lose a minor sense of closure. To you from the outside, it might sound like a trivial tale, but I have a feeling that for some, this story might mean something. I have been accused, and rightly so, of being easily distracted. It's true my mind goes in multiple directions with little resistance like a pinball, which could explain why I enjoy the game so much. Allowing yourself to get distracted can be a benefit, but also a curse. If my focus on a topic is casual, I can be pulled down other thought paths for a number of different reasons. Maybe the other path is shinier, more entertaining, or my heart just wasn't in the first topic to begin with. And see, right there, I'm already getting distracted by describing how I can get distracted. Don't worry, eventually this should loop back upon itself. In 1981, I was 13. I knew very little about a lot. My grandparents, who had officially retired a few years earlier, had decided that it was time to broaden me, whatever that means. I had nothing better to do that summer, so just went along with their plans. They took me on a whirlwind trip from Seattle, where I grew up, to different parts of the eastern seaboard, ending in a relaxing stay on St. Thomas in the U.S. Virgin Islands. This trip presented some challenges at my young age. One was that I would have to leave school a week early, which meant that all of my classmates were going to ask me where I was going. What's the big deal, right? Being that I was a 13-year-old sci-fi geek, I was most certainly a virgin. I wouldn't even have my first big kiss for another two years. My intellect, however, was developing nicely, and so I could foresee the inevitable low-brow humor from junior high school kids who were going to find out that I would be spending part of my summer in the Virgin Islands because, well, you know, a virgin teenage boy going to a place with the word virgin in the title. Might as well paint a huge target on my back while you are at it. Think of the jokes I would hear in the hallways, the cat calls at the lunch table, from the first day they knew right up until the moment I left. And it wouldn't end there. Once the summer had ended and we all returned to school, it would have started back up again with questions like, Oh, hey, how was your trip to the Virgin Islands, you sad virgin? So yeah, I wasn't going to be partaking in that endless barrage of shenanigans. I'm smart, but I can also be quite clever. I decided that publicly, I wasn't going to the Virgin Islands. I was going to the Bahamas, and my classmates would never know the difference. Hell, the trolls of my youth probably couldn't even spell Bahamas. I only mention this because when I look at my junior high annual, the majority of the signatures said that they hoped I had fun in the Bahamas. To this day, I take some pride in that little deception, and I never told a soul, until now. While having fun in the Virgin Island sun, I was exposed to something that would haunt me. In the beginning, it was a seed, a whisper of a distant song. I was walking back from an afternoon of swimming when I heard a looping chorus from a radio in a maintenance shack. I was 13 and didn't know much about music, only that I liked catchy vocals. In less than a minute, I found out for the first time what it was to have a song truly stuck in your head. But it wasn't a song, just a small piece of it. I couldn't even know for sure the words because it was off in the distance and distorted by the ocean breeze. The best I could make out was a line, watch him rise, watch him fall, and the never-ending chorus, Meteor Man. That's right, he's a meteor man. And that seed grew ever so slowly as I went through the music phases of my life. My friends in high school listened to early metal, so I did. In college, I listened to top 40 mixes, electronica mixes, and alternative bands. After a while, I started sampling everything because why not? But not a year went by that I didn't play that little Meteor Man chorus in my head a few times. As time passed, I became more surprised that I hadn't accidentally run into it. If it was on the radio in 1981, I should have seen it once on MTV, but I didn't. By the mid-90s, there were a number of retro shows that covered all the music videos of the 80s, both good and bad. They even dedicated an entire channel to the early videos called VH1, and still 
the song never surfaced. And when the internet blossomed into a high-speed information machine, I thought, now, finally, I would be able to scan and find it. The obvious appeared on the radar. The 1978 song Meteor Man by D.D. Jackson should have resulted in more clues, but I didn't even bother to listen to the whole song or even give it much thought because of this. The song I had heard back on the beach in 1981 was an English male voice with a bit of an accent I couldn't quite put my finger on. In 1993, there was a mainstream movie called The Meteor Man, but that was in 1993. The soundtrack to the movie was no help either. If anything, that film just muddied the internet waters and filled all the search pages with useless references. What started as months had turned into years which turned into decades. I had absorbed libraries of media, and still the chorus haunted me. Meteor Man, that's right, he's a meteor man. And then, last week, I was turning in for the evening, slowly drifting to sleep as I thought about unfinished trivia I want to look into the next day, some idle thoughts about Paul Young and his song Love of the Common People. I didn't know the exact title then, but was going to look it up. Turns out that Love of the Common People was originally sung by Waylon Jennings in 1967. One of the lyrics was, Smile from the heart of a family man. Sometimes when I hear the term describing man, I think of Indiana Jones and only the penitent man shall pass. Penitent, penitent. From there, I thought again of Meteor Man and the chorus and how it has irritated me for decades. And then for a fraction of a second, a random and very distracting thought kicked in. That of a recent documentary, Fake Famous, and how social media has become the new credibility. Social media the doom of us all. Media. Meteor. The words sound similar in the right light. I chuckled to myself as the last breath of consciousness left me for the night. Wouldn't that be funny if it was Media Man all along? I woke the next day and eventually got back in front of this machine. Looked up Paul Young first. All right, that guy. Then changed my search for Media Man song. And there it was, exactly one rough copy of the video uploaded to YouTube 16 years ago from a VHS tape. In disbelief, I searched for the origins as I listened to the chorus over and over. Media Man, created by a two-man group out of Australia called Flash and The Pan from their second album, Lights in the Night, released in December of 1980. And it was no wonder that I had missed it. American media had ignored this band and their albums almost entirely. The best I can guess is that I first heard it played from a radio station on the British Virgin Islands that are next to the U.S. territory, and I happened to be in the right place at the right time. That splinter of a song sat in my head for 42 years until God decided to have a little fun and slightly changed my perspective. But there was still something missing. The line, watch him rise, watch him fall, wasn't in the video. Were there two versions of the song? After a little more research, I found the original LP track, a full two minutes longer with the completed verse that goes, see him push, see him crawl, watch him rise, watch him fall. The excuse, says the parrot in the tree, is what my public want to see. I literally threw up my hands in celebration. The circle was complete. I could now die happy. You have no idea. It turns out that there were two versions of the song on the album, giving radio stations the option of playing either depending on time constraints. I just got lucky that the island station decided to go with the longer one that day. I had given up all hope of hearing that song again and in retrospect was justified in thinking that. Record stores, friends with huge music collections, both analog and digital. 1981 to 2023, and I never heard a single second of it. Even today, the song is barely listed in Wiki as an unclickable reference to the band or the songwriter. In the days that followed, I played it over and over while doing more research on the people who created the song. The irony was thick. 
If you're from the U.S., you may not have heard of the Media Man song or the band Flash and the Pan, but you have been touched by the writer in one way or another. The songwriter in question is George Young, seen here with Harry Vonda from Flash and the Pan. George Young had a hell of a musical career. He was a member of a successful Australian band, The Easy Beats, and wrote a number of their hits in the 1960s. Turns out George is also part of a talented musical family. Here he is helping two of his younger brothers compose some music. The two brothers in question happen to be Malcolm and Angus Young, who are, of course, the backbone of the legendary rock group ACDC. George and Harry co-produced most of the first-generation ACDC albums, including TNT, High Voltage, Dirty Deeds Done Dirt Cheap, Let There Be Rock, and Powerage. Then they started up their own band, Flash in the Pan, for three or four albums and came back later to produce the ACDC albums Who Made Who and Blow Up Your Video. Go figure. His music has been with me in one form or another for decades. I just didn't know it. George passed away in 2017, so I never had the chance to thank him for the 42-year itch I couldn't scratch and the path that finally ended with Media Man. So thank you, George and Harry. It was a very long but fun journey.